I have breast cancer and I have a family. I have breast cancer and I have a job. I have breast cancer and I have plans. I'm in treatment. I'm triple negative. I'm metastatic. I'm BRCA positive. I'm new to this. I have breast cancer and I needed someone to talk to. I needed information. I needed help with my bills. I needed to know what chemo would be like. I needed to know I could do this. Living Beyond Breast Cancer is a national cancer organization created by and for women with breast cancer and those who love them. We provide support and advice, organize programs and activities to raise awareness and hope. I have breast cancer. And I have support. I have information. I have advice. I have breast cancer and I have hope. I have living beyond breast cancer. Welcome, everyone. If you are looking for a seat, if, there's this, if there are empty chairs at your table, can you raise your hands so people can easily find? There's plenty. We'll make room for, we will absolutely make room for everybody. <laughs> All right, so while, while you're filtering in, um, I'm Jean Sachs. I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer. And I am so thrilled to welcome you all to Philadelphia. Uh, to our 13th annual conference on metastatic breast cancer. We are so pleased that many of you took the time to travel very far to be here and also made this a priority um, on, a, on an early spring weekend. For those of you that are new to the organization, our vision is a world where, the, where people impacted by breast cancer don't feel alone or uninformed. And we work on this every day through our mission, which is providing trusted information and a community of support. And today is really you know, our vision, our mission and vision in action, because while you are gonna hear from some incredible healthcare providers that we've brought from around the country, I think what you're really gonna get out of this weekend is each other. So get to know each other. I, I'm hoping you all leave with a lot of, a lot of new friends. Um, and there's so many ways to stay connected. So that is a big part of what we do. Um, living Beyond Breast Cancer has been very committed to serving those living with metastatic breast cancer for a long time. In 2005, and some of you were probably very young in 2005. <laughs> I was younger. Um, maybe it was 14 years ago, we did the first study to learn about the needs of those living with metastatic breast cancer. Because no one was really paying attention. You know, there was a lot of women running races in pink and all about sur you know, survival and feeling great, but no one was really saying, what's it like to live with, the, with a metastatic diagnosis? And we learned some things that I think you all know, which is that it is isolating, it is scary, you can't just walk into any support group and feel welcomed. And so we had a lot of outcomes from that needs assessment, but one of them was starting this conference. And we have been doing it for 13 years, and it's just grown bigger and bigger every year. So thank you. We have a lot of our friends in the advocacy community here with us this weekend. And Two of them are actually, um, well, one is celebrating their fifth anniversary, and that is MedUp. Um, make sure you visit their table. And then there's two other organizations that are doing some really important research and studies to learn more about your diagnosis so we can kind of hopefully get closer to finding a cure sooner. So please visit the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project as well as the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance. They have programs that they want you to sign up for. So take a few minutes and make sure you do that. I also want to sort of call out, um, for the last five years, Living Beyond Breast Cancer has been running a program called Hear My Voice. Um, this is where we have an application process, find women and men around the country living with metastatic breast cancer, and we train them to be advocates. It's been an amazingly powerful program. We have our new class here with us, as well as many of our returning veterans. So please stand up so we can see you all. I'm sure you're spread around the room. <laughs> and
and this is a training. And the metastatic breast cancer network, sorry, of course. And visit all of the exhibitors. We have, a, they're, they're packed, so just take your time to see everyone. Um, so I think it's always really nice to start by finding out who's in the room and what's your experience with cancer. So I'm gonna have various people stand. So if you have, were diagnosed in this year, under a year, please stand up so we can see how many we have newly diagnosed people. And then you guys can sit down. And how about those that have been living with metastatic breast cancer for one to three years? All right. And how about four to six? I know that's, wow, amazing. And how about over seven? So for those of you that are new to this, I do hope this gives you inspiration and hope. And get to know these people. They're all here, so find them, seek them out, and talk to them. So to sort of drive that point home even a little bit stronger, I'm going to bring up Margaret Sukati, who served on the Living Beyond Breast Cancer Board from 2013 till 2018. We were really sad that you rotated off, but we're gonna, we keep her very involved. Um, and she's going to just say a few words. Can you hear me? Good morning. As Jean said, uh, this is the 13th metastatic breast cancer conference hosted by Living Beyond Breast Cancer. And while some might feel that 13 is an unlucky number, I am embracing it because this year marks my 13th year living with metastatic breast cancer. <laughs> It was the fall of 2006 when I was diagnosed with stage four de novo inflammatory breast cancer. I'm the youngest of five girls in my family and none of them have breast cancer. Like many of you, there isn't one date or mark with metastatic breast cancer because it's this weird unfolding of an appointment and a scan and another appointment and another scan and maybe a biopsy and maybe a repeat. So I just say the fall, which is <laughs> sort of perfect. <laughs> um, but it's year 13 and I will take it. I consider it very lucky. And here I am today looking forward and looking out at all of you, and I want to applaud all of you who are just getting started because it was five years before I attended a breast cancer conference, and I don't quite know what took me so long. But looking out and seeing all of you and that magical feeling of walking into a room and seeing people like yourself, the wigs, the fuzz, the shortish hair, the long locks, we all can relate to the different stages and the things that were going on. So I need to prepare you that there will be times this weekend when you're going to be listening to a conversation, maybe in the bathroom, and you're going to be nodding. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. And suddenly there'll be another discussion about your worst infusion or, oh my gosh, you should see my scar. And you will be sharing intimate details with people that you have never seen before. And that's okay. It's good to just get to 60, zero to 60. Let's talk, let's share. And that's what's so important about this weekend and what's so important about living beyond breast cancer is when you walk in this room and you start nodding your head and you start sharing details about your journey, that's the point. You're not alone here. You are in this room full of people who care about you learning more, feeling better, feeling hopeful. And for me, that's what Living Beyond Breast Cancer has done. It has introduced me to so many women and men and doctors and researchers and all the exhibitors out there, and I don't feel as alone as I did. And I have made friends through 
you know, Instagram and social media, all that stuff, but also people that I reconnect with once a year, and not unlike a great high school friend where you sort of pick up where you left off, that's how it can be. So please, embrace this weekend, embrace each other, share, and I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful experience here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. Um, I want to take a minute to thank the amazing sponsors that make this conference possible. Um, we have some very major sponsors this year. We have Lilly Oncology, who, who is our leadership sponsor, and our title sponsors, Celgene and Novartis. Um, as you make your way through the exhibit hall and you visit with the sponsors and the advocacy partners, please say thank you. We could not do this work without the support of those that, you know, get provide philanthropy back to the organization. So speaking of philanthropy, I want to start um, by bringing up Forward for Toby, and Jody Sorarino, Sorarino is going to say a few words. And as she's coming up, I just want to tell you how Living Beyond Breast Cancer got to know Forward for Toby. Three years ago, we lost our travel grant sponsor, and I will I will remain nameless who our travel grant sponsor was. But anyway, they decided they weren't going to fund our travel grants anymore. And we were panicked. Because how many of you are here on a travel grant? Can you just raise your hand? I mean, who, you know, who has the money to come to this conference when you have metastatic breast cancer? It's just not possible. Um, and what, so we got a call from Jody. Just, it was, you could say it was serendipity, it was meant to be, and they were looking for a way to support women living with metastatic, and we said, you know what, we have a way to put your money to work right away. <laughs> um, and they came on as our travel grant sponsor three years ago, and they've been with us ever since, which has been great. We received 248 applications for travel grants and fee waivers from 37 states, two, two from Canada, um, and we were able not to close them this year, both because of the support of Forward for Toby, as well as because of the support of, anon of an anonymous donor who said to us, do not close your travel grants this year, just keep accepting them and I will make sure they're covered. So, so I'm gonna let Jody say a few words. Thank you. I know I speak for our whole group when I say how thrilled we are to be with you today. This is our third year sponsoring the LBBC conference, providing travel grants to help offset the cost to attend this very, very important meeting. So who are we? We represent the Ford for Toby Foundation, a nonprofit dedicated to helping women and men with metastatic breast cancer live a better quality of life. We started this foundation in memory of our dear childhood friend, Toby, who was diagnosed at stage four, and throughout all of her chemo and radiation, her bone pain, her nausea, she worried about everyone else. Specifically, she worried about her Mets, brothers and sisters here. She was angry that not enough focus was spent on metastatic breast cancer. She often talked about giving back somehow. She wanted to do something. Unfortunately, she passed away before she could bring all of this to fruition. But this is her legacy, a foundation solely focused on metastatic breast cancer, solely focused on taking away the financial burden so often accompanied with this disease. Since inception, we've paid mortgages and rent, paid for childcare, and paid for car repairs, and for the third year in a row, we've paid for many of you to attend this very, very important conference. In fact, Toby loved this conference. She would come home with ways to manage her side effects, new meds to research, but most important, and uh, as the speaker said before us, she came home with a new group of amazing friends and a very positive outlook on her future. She also came home with tales of financial woes. She met patients who were struggling to make their rent payment that month. She met women who lost their job and then their insurance. That is why we're here 
That's why to date we've contributed $125,000 to this wonderful organization to help defray the cost of your attendance. If Toby were here today, she would have loved to meet every one of you. But she wouldn't have wanted to thank you. She would have said, let's just pay it forward. So if you find our mission compelling, please help us get the word out. We want to be known because the more people who know us, the more money we can raise. And the more money we raise, the more money we can put in the pockets of those who really need it. We're all volunteers, making it possible for 97% of every dollar to go directly to patients. Since we started this foundation almost five years ago, we've raised well over half a million dollars. But we can do more, and we will. So please enjoy this amazing conference, learn a lot, and soak everything up you can. Thrive. And please stop by our booth and talk to us, tell us your story, and if you receive one of our grants, we hope it helps just a little. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, there are a couple other organizations that do help support our travel grants, and that is the Amerisource Bergen Foundation and the Paula A. Seidman Fund, and also Southwest Airlines. I know some of you probably came here on a Southwest flight, right? A few of you did. So they've been a great partner, um, and they have been giving us um, free round-trip tickets for the last couple of years in memory of one of their top executives who actually did not pass away from breast cancer but really cared about the issue. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to the why you're all here, which is to start um, the program off. Um, but I have to tell you that we have a Snapchat filter. I don't really know what that is. But if you guys, um, you know, we share on social media. We, we want people to know you're here. We wanna hear your stories. So I know my staff can help you do that as well. So I'm really pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, who is never our second choice for anything, but we did lose our plenary speaker. You can imagine what this week was like for my staff on Monday. Um, but we couldn't be more thrilled that Dr. Angie D. Michelle stepped in. She is the Jill and Alan Miller Endowed Chair in Breast Cancer Excellence. She's the co-leader of the breast cancer program at the Abramson Cancer Center, which is right here in Philadelphia, a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. So that's what her title is. But to me, Angie, who I have known, I don't know, probably for 20 years, she is a compassionate, smart, intelligent, giving doctor who has been a champion of living beyond breast cancer really since our inception. She has treated so many of the women and men that we have gotten to know. And she just finished her three month sabbatical. So this is her first week back. So the fact that she came back to probably, I don't even know what, but I mean, she was doing research and things, but, and said, sure, I'll be with you on Saturday. So. I'm so pleased to bring up Dr. D. Michelle. Hi. <laughs> You're You're not supposed to make the speaker cry when you introduce them. Um, hey, everybody. Good morning. Um, I, I am truly, uh, really privileged to be here today. And in fact, I, I think it was kismet because um, Lisa Carey, who was going to be giving the, the talk today, uh, is, is a, a close colleague and friend of mine. And living beyond breast cancer is, is just means the world to me. And so here I am. I wouldn't, wouldn't ever say no to the opportunity to come speak to all of you and to help this organization that I think is really, really remarkable for the attention that they have paid to metastatic breast cancer when nobody else was doing it. And so what I want to help you do today uh, is to really feel empowered by the knowledge that people are paying attention to metastatic breast cancer, in fact, more than ever before, that we are learning so much about why metastatic breast cancer exists, how it exists, how it survives, and how we can better treat it. And I think it's just an incredibly hopeful time. You know, um, I, this 
July will be my 20th year in practice, which is kind of hard to believe. I'm dating myself, I know. I started when I was 10, so, you know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but so, you know, it, start, it starts to give you some perspective about where we were when I started. And when we start, when I started out, metastatic breast cancer was just treated like early breast cancer. We didn't know that it was different. We didn't know that it needed special drugs and special ways of being treated. And that really has just done a 360 degree change in that 20 years. Now 20 years is a long time and I'm not saying it's gonna take another 20 years to get to where we can say we can cure every woman with metastatic breast cancer because I see the changes happening faster and faster. The technology is accelerating all of this. And that means we're not going to have to wait another 20 years to get to the point where things can get to a point where patients can live with metastatic breast cancer. And I do hope, ultimately, as we all do, that no woman will ever get metastatic breast cancer. So that's the goal, right? But today, what I want to tell you is where we are now. And you know, I was given the title of this talk. And um, I think it's, it's got the C word in it. And the C word isn't cancer, right? We all know the C word. The C word is cure. That's a tough word. It's a tough word when you're dealing with metastatic breast cancer, I know. Of course, we would love to have a cure. And that is what we try to do every single day in our research programs and uh, in our drug development and everything we do. But we also could use a different C word, which is chronic. And maybe we're not at cure yet, but we are, I believe, at chronic. And what does chronic mean? Chronic means you're living with it. And here you are. And I have to say, I just got a chill when I saw people standing up at five, six, seven years. Because, yeah, it's not good enough. We need to get to cure. But if you can live, and now people are living years, if not decades, with this disease, well, that gives us a chance. It gives you a chance to be here to reach your goals, to live your life. It also gives you a chance to be here when that cure comes along. And so I don't want us to uh, minimize the importance of the chronic nature of the disease, but we know that that comes with very special challenges as well, because when you're living with a chronic disease, it's with you every day. And that's another thing that we, as a medical community, really haven't paid enough attention to. What is, it that it, what is it like to live with this disease every day? To try to go to work, to try to raise your kids, to make it to your appointments, to pay for all this therapy, to burden your friends and family when you are an independent person who never wanted to do that. It hits you like a meteor, out of the blue. You didn't know it was coming. You just got to make the best of it. And we need to do more to help you with that. So I think we're all adjusting to this idea that Metastatic breast cancer will be and is a, a, a disease women are going to be living with for a very long time. And that is why we need to understand it better. And once we understand it, that knowledge is power, both for you in understanding your disease and for us as researchers to come up with better strategies. So let's get started. That was a long introduction, sorry. But I, I felt it was important to set the stage because I, I wanna, wanna let you know that that I think about this a lot. And I hope, I hope that I understand what you're going through to some extent. And I know that this can be hard, and I, I hope that I won't say anything that will upset you today. So if I do, I apologize. OK, disclosures, important. I do research. I do clinical trials, which means I need to work with drug companies. But I work with them in partnership. I don't work for them. I work with them. They supply funding for me to be able to do the research, to be able to treat patients with their drugs. But I don't work for the companies. And then I just did want to acknowledge that many of the slides you're going to see today uh, are from my colleague, Lisa Carey. And um, some of them are mine. And she and I work together to really try to put together the best possible program for you today. So she is, in fact, with you here today in spirit, even though she couldn't be here in person. All right, so here's what I'm going to talk about in the next, oh, how much time do I have? Half an hour, 40 minutes left. <laughs> uh, so when you leave this talk this morning, what I hope you will understand is what metastatic breast cancer is. I hope you'll understand what we now know about the biology and what this thing called tumor genomic testing is. 
and how it works and how it can work for you. And then where we are with treatment, what's known and what's coming down the pike. So that's the goal. Okay, here we go. So we're gonna start simple and work up to complicated, right? And so just the very simplest question, what is metastatic breast cancer? And I know that seems obvious, but I bet you there's at least one person in this room who's not really sure what that is because maybe you're a friend or a family member and you're afraid to ask, what does that really mean? So let's start simple and just make sure everybody's on the same page. Metastatic breast cancer is a malignant growth or tumor that results from the division of abnormal cells, not in the breast, but actually that have come from the breast. Okay, they are breast cancer cells that have gone to some other part of the body. Now this looks a little complicated, but I'm gonna walk you through it. Okay, so I start on the left-hand side. There's the tumor that is in the breast. How does that tumor in the breast lead to metastatic breast cancer? Well, there are, we now know that there are some very specialized seed cells in that tumor that can leave the breast, leave that primary tumor. They travel through the bloodstream and they travel as what we call circulating tumor cells or CTCs uh, and we call this population of cells minimal residual disease. These are some new terms that you may or may not have heard about yet, but this all reflects what we're now learning. And so what I'm showing you here is really uh, only a few years old in terms of understanding how this works. What we know is that those cells then home their way to many little niches where they like to live and can stay alive. And one of the primary ones is the bone marrow. So when they go to the bone marrow, they go to sleep. And they can sleep there for months or years or even decades. And they can, they, it's sort of like a computer powering down. The cell stops dividing, it sort of turns off its electrical system, but it doesn't die. That's a very unusual characteristic for a cancer cell. Cancer cells tend to stay alive by dividing. These cells have the ability to stay alive without dividing. They go to sleep, they sit there, they wait. Sometimes your body takes care of them. Sometimes your immune system figures out they're there. Sometimes they just poop out and die on their own. But in some cases, they reactivate. They wake up. The power comes back on. They start dividing again. They then make their way out of the bone marrow. Now, the DTC stands for disseminated tumor cells. And that's what happens. They disseminate out of the bone marrow, back into the bloodstream, and find their way to other places. So that's really the nature of how it works. For a long time, we only focused on the very far left side and treating the primary breast cancer. We've learned a lot about treating the far right side, metastatic breast cancer. I'm not gonna go into it today, but one of the things I really focus on in my research is what about what's in the middle? How are we gonna find those cells? How are we gonna understand how they work and how are we gonna target them. But that's a topic for another day. So I just wanted to really give you the big picture. So let's move on from here. So it's breast cancer if it arose from cells that com comprise the breast, can divide and grow without normal control, and is able to invade other tissues, and it doesn't matter if it's in the breast or in the lung or in the liver, wherever it is, because it came from the breast, it's breast cancer, okay? So breast cancer and any other site other than the breast or the lymph nodes is what we call metastatic. So again, let's step back and look at the big picture. We have different goals at different points in time when we think about what's happening in the world of breast cancer. Obviously, we would love to prevent precancerous changes in the breast from turning into breast cancer in the first place, and there's a lot going on in the prevention world to do that. Most of the breast cancer is, that's diagnosed is stage one, two, and three. It's limited to the breast and lymph nodes. In fact, only about 10% to 15% of breast cancer that's diagnosed is metastatic. It's, very, it's rare that it's diagnosed in stage four. It's typically the case that patients start in stage one, two, or three, and then move to stage four. And so we're doing a lot in that early stage, stage one, two, three, to really try to get these cells when we can before they get somewhere else. But unfortunately, it can become metastatic. And I guess, again, I think this curability issue is 
we pay, you know, we, we, we hear this, is it curable? But I, again, I want us to focus on, is it manageable? Is it treatable? Is it something you can live with? And those are our goals, allowing you to live the best possible life, the most normal life that you can despite having this disease, without losing the fact that someday we want a cure. So what do we understand about biology of metastatic breast cancer? So here's a little quiz. Who looks scarier, the guy on the left or the guy on the right? Well, you get my point, right? You can't tell what drives metastatic breast cancer just by looking at it. Um, you gotta dig deeper. If we just look under the microscope, they all look the same, but they're not. Some of them are bonos, don't behave very badly at all, and some of them are Madoffs, and they're not very well behaved at all. So we needed to dig deeper, we knew that. And a lot of what we learned has really come from animal studies, to be honest, from the laboratory, from growing these cells in addition, seeing what happens to them when you perturb certain things about their environment. And so it's really been a very close collaboration with basic scientists to help us understand what is happening, and the use of new tools, new genomic tools, new tools for very precise analysis of individual cells that's now making this possible. And genetics is really the key. It's not the whole story, but it's the place we've started. It's the place where we know the most. So let's just make sure we're on the same page about what we mean when we talk about genetics and mutations, okay? Because that's what we know the most about in terms of metastatic breast cancer. So your genes, they could be the pants you're wearing, but in fact, they can also be these little things inside all of your cells uh, that are the code, okay? They're the code that contains your DNA that controls everything your body does. And it's like a language. It tells the cells what to do. It makes proteins that give the, tools, the cells the tools they need to do their jobs. So that language has to be spelled properly. And you can imagine that if you're speaking a language or writing a language and you change a letter, you can change the meaning of a word. And if you change the meaning of a word, you can change the meaning of a paragraph and that ultimately can lead to really changing everything you're trying to communicate. And it's just like that in your body. One little letter change, one small spelling change can yield a whole host of problems that ultimately lead to cancer. So a mutation is just the spelling change. It's just the spelling change in that DNA that ultimately leads to the DNA not being read correctly, the protein not being uh, appropriately translated. So there are two kinds of mutations, and so you've heard about BRCA1 and 2. Those are mutations that people are born with and are handed down. They're inherited. Another thing you can blame on your parents, as if there weren't enough things. Very few breast cancers are inherited, only about five to 10%. The vast majority are not. But that's one way in which you get these spelling changes. The other is this term called somatic. It means something happened along the way and something happened to that cell where that spelling change occurred. And maybe it was because you had an exposure or many exposures over many years. Something damaged the cell and it wasn't able to repair it. It wasn't able to hit spell check and fix the word, and things just kept going till ultimately it became cancer, okay? So that's the difference between inherited and somatic. So why do we care? As I said, it becomes genes become RNA, which becomes protein. And so if you, if you mess up the spelling at the DNA level, you can see that your proteins are gonna be all out of whack, and there can be a million things that go wrong everywhere in between. So it's complicated, right? It's complicated, you can make too much of the protein, you can make a protein that doesn't work, you can lose the protein altogether. All of these are explanations for why breast cancer becomes metastatic. So understanding which mechanism is happening to your cancer is bound to be important in figuring out how to best treat it. So we're still at the point of understanding what these changes are, we're trying to take that knowledge and apply it to how we should use it to treat patients. And so we are developing all kinds of different tests. It's not, the detail on this slide is not important. What you need to know is there's a lot of tests out there, not just a gene test, but protein tests, RNA tests. Lots of things are gonna be coming 
that are designed to help us understand, but not all of them are useful yet. And I know that's very frustrating because it seems like it's taking too long, and I agree with you. But it's important to recognize what we know and what we don't know. And something that seems logical might not ultimately turn out to be true or practical. And so we have to be careful that we carefully do the science and make sure we really understand what's going on, or we could head down a path that's wrong and treat lots of people the wrong way. So, so how do we figure this all out when there's so many things going on? It's like that classic tale of the blindfolded scientists all feeling a different part of the elephant. You know, They're all feeling something different when it's all part of a whole. So we have to work together. It isn't just the physicians. It isn't just the lab scientists. It isn't just the pharmaceutical companies. It isn't just the um, device companies. We all have to work together to make sense of this so that we can get to our goals. I also wanted to just clarify a few other terms for you. Omics is this neologism that really refers to just some sort of collective approach. These are the ones that we talk about, the punome being the most recent, which is based on your gut biology. <laughs> but, um, but genome is really the one we've best studied so far. So as I said, when that spelling change occurs, it wreaks havoc. And what happens is that normal cell starts to divide in abnormal ways. And as you move through subsequent divisions, you start to see cells that are more and more disordered. The more and, and as they try to divide and do their jobs, they accumulate more and more mutations. So that's why some people have only one mutation and some people have lots of mutations. And it's a bit of a uh, sort of random thing as to which mutations you um, end up accumulating over time. But it, it's, it's really, it's almost like, OK, particularly if it's um, important that the letters go in a certain order, what if you drop a letter out? You don't just learn, lose the meaning of that word. But if you actually drop that letter out and moved all the letters together, you'd lose the meaning in the next word, and the next word, and the next word. And that's really what this is all about. It's this accumulation of mutations over time. What you need to know is just that there are techniques out there that yield this kind of a picture. And people like Chuck Peru were really instrumental 20 years ago at using a technique called uh, expression arrays for RNA that was able to then go in there and actually pick up all of these spelling changes. And this is something that comes out on a chip. It doesn't look like much. It looks like even less when it comes out in the computer, thank God. But what it's really telling us is what is the constellation of these mutations. So lest you think it's as simple as I simply am trying to explain it, it's not. It's really, really complicated. And yet it's going to be sorted out. We can do this. We have the tools. Uh, and so we really are now trying to take that knowledge and bring it to the clinic to understand how are the tumors changing over time. What's happening when you treat them? They're getting resistant. Clearly, something's happening. The cancer might have been responding to the treatment you're on, and then a few months later, it stops. Well, clearly, something happened to that tumor. In all likelihood, it was a genetic change that happened. So can we understand those changes that are occurring even while you're on treatment? Not just the changes that led you to get metastatic breast cancer, but I think what we're really also very interested in is what happens once you have metastatic breast cancer and you're getting treatments, why doesn't that first treatment work forever? Because really, if we could find a treatment that worked forever, well, that would be a huge step. And we all know that, unfortunately, right now, our treatments don't work forever. So what we now know is we can't just look at the tumor that you had at the beginning, say you were diagnosed in 2015, but you didn't get your metastases until 2019. We need to see that 2019 tumor. And then as you get treated, we need to keep looking because cancer really evolves even beyond the point where it's cancer. So it's not just one cancer. I've shown you that there's lots of different flavors. But importantly, it's that your flavor changes over time. And that's something I think can be sort of hard to get your head around. Um, and different kinds of breast cancer have different kinds of genomic profiles. So, there are some commonalities to triple negative breast cancer and HER2 positive breast cancer 
and ER positive breast cancer in terms of the kinds of mutations they get. So there are some groupings, even though one person's HER2 positive breast cancer might have very different mutations than another person's HER2 positive breast cancer. So we've been trying to tackle this, and I don't want to be self-serving. It's just a, an illustration. There are many programs like this around the country that are trying to go about this in a very organized fashion and really start to try to learn from every biopsy. So our study of PEN is called Metamorph, and the idea is that if a patient needs to have a biopsy to understand whether it's a metastatic lesion or not, then we should be learning as much as we can from that biopsy, just about all of the things I've told you about today. So patients are offered the opportunity to contribute a piece of that biopsy to the laboratory where we do the genomic testing, and we use this to build a bank. And we already have about 250 tumors in the bank. We collect the tumor that that patient had from the primary breast, and importantly, we also collect blood for those circulating tumor cells and disseminated tumor cells so that we can start to learn about that middle portion as well. And that's really important because once the cancer becomes metastatic and goes to another part of the body, those cells are still in the circulation because tumors are turning over and they're spilling some of their DNA into the blood. And they're also spreading, unfortunately, as we all know. And when they do that, they've got to get to that next site somehow. Well, they do it through the bloodstream. So we now have techniques that allow us to collect blood and actually test it for the mutations, right? And so if we could do that, then we could spare you all of those biopsies that we know are risky and uncomfortable and difficult. And that's, again, another goal and another way in which I think things are really developing. So we call this liquid biopsy because we're trying to understand what's happening to the tumor without biopsying the tumor just through the blood. So this is a little bit of a complicated chart. There's a, I'll just tell you what I want you to learn from it. Along the side where those numbers say 14, blah, 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 each of those rows is a patient who's in that study of ours, OK? And next to that are the blue and orange and red uh, uh, squares. That's the kind of breast cancer they have, whether it's triple negative or ER positive, whatever. Off to the right, then you start to see all of those other little squa squares, the forest green and the purple and the red. Do you see those? And above that, along the top, are the different mutations that we found. And so just in this small group of patients who gave blood, who had metastatic breast cancer, we saw that we could see from the forest green boxes, the same mutation that was in the tumor was in the blood. From the red boxes, which you see there are very few of them, we only found the mutation in the tumor. We didn't find it in the blood. So we're finding almost all the mutations now in the blood. We don't have to go to the tumor. But also, very importantly, as you start to look off to the right, you see the purple and the gray boxes. Those are mutations we only saw in the blood and not in the tumor. And why would that be? You think, well, maybe it's wrong. Maybe the DNA is from somewhere else. No, we track the DNA back to the tumor. We know that this is tumor DNA. So why would we find mutations that we didn't see in the biopsy? Well, right, so that's one, uh, one possibility. But, the, but I think what's more likely and what we also know is that tumors are not homogeneous things. Every cell in the tumor is not the same. As I showed you that dividing, you start to see that when one cell divides into two, one of those two cells may have a certain mutation, another one might not, and then those divide. And so what happens is a metastatic tumor is a cluster of cells that are in some ways similar to each other and in many ways different from each other. So when we go in and do a biopsy, we're only getting a very small portion of that tumor. And there may be many other mutations in that tumor that we're just not getting because we're not biopsying the whole tumor. And we can pick those up in the blood. So in that way, doing a liquid biopsy is even better than doing a tumor biopsy. So how could this affect curability of the disease? Well, it sort of makes sense, right? If you knew what the profile was for your cancer and there were drugs that were good for that profile, those mutations, then you'd want to match your tumor to the right treatments. And <clears throat> it's tough because these are very rare cells. 
And it's also tough because some of our initial attempts to do this really didn't work very well. So it turns out that, of course, like everything else with cancer, it's more than what meets the eye. It's complicated. And just because you have a mutation doesn't mean that's what's driving the process. So I think about it like a car. You can have drivers and passengers, right? Some mutations are the drivers. They're the ones that are deciding where that car, where that tumor is going to go, and how fast it's going to go, and what turns it's going to make. Those are the driver mutations. But there are also quite a number of passenger mutations who are just along for the ride. They're not dictating anything about what that tumor is doing, but you find them. And one of the trickiest things that we haven't quite been able to figure out yet is how to figure out which of the mutations we see are the drivers and which of them are the passengers. Because if you target the passenger, if you give a drug that kills the passenger, it doesn't stop the car. You got to get the driver. And so that's been another real challenge. I, I think the fact that we understand that that's the problem means that we can now solve it. For a long time, we didn't understand that. We thought, well, you, of course, you would just find whatever mutation there is and target it. Of course, it would work. And it didn't. So again, the more you learn, the more you realize you need to learn. And those, those cancers are tricky. And so as much as we try to stay ahead, you know, they're trying to keep up as well. So here are a bunch of drugs um, that are targeting a bunch of genes through a bunch of trials where we really tried to figure out where, if you had the mutation, did you get a response? And what you can see on the far right side under association is that for some drugs, it really did matter. So for example, with PARP inhibitors, if you have a germline BRCA1 or 2 mutation, you're much more likely to respond to that drug because that's a driver mutation, OK? With others, as you look down, for example, ESR1. ESR1 is the estrogen receptor. It's a common mutation that happens in estrogen receptors after someone's been on anti-estrogen therapy for a long time. We had, a, we had drugs that we thought would target those mutations, and they don't. So sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But the fact is, now we do trials to look. We're not just giving drugs to everyone without figuring out what the cancer looks like, what flavor it is beforehand. And we are really targeting our trials to specific populations. Now, that can be very frustrating as a patient because a drug is looking good and you want it, but you don't have the mutation that would predict you would go, be able to respond, so you're not eligible for the trial. Our goal is to have trials for everyone, every mutation. So you've heard about something called the MATCH trial, perhaps. And the first iteration of the MATCH trial is just ending. This was run by the Nas National Cancer Institute. And basically, patients would have, with any kind of cancer, would have, it, um, would have it profiled and send it in, and then they'd be matched to a drug. But there were only a limited number of drugs available. And some of them were successful, and some of them weren't. But we learned a lot from that trial. And I just came back last month from the planning meeting for the next MATCH trials that are going to be now starting to combine different targeted therapies, understand the drivers, and not just hit one, but maybe, you know, unlike cars, in some cases there are multiple drivers. And so we might need to combine the drugs. And what's the role of the immune system? And I'm going to get to that in just a moment, but we never should be forgetting that this is all happening in your body where your immune system is supposed to be protecting you. And so in the future, we're not going to just be doing trials that target these things in the tumor, but we have to target the immune system too. So that's coming. And you know, the National Cancer Institute has made an enormous commitment to do that next set of trials for metastatic patients. And so as much as we complain about not having enough support um, from the NIH and the NCI for our research, and we really don't, they are doing some things right. And that is, you all should feel very good about the fact that your tax dollars are going to support the next set of match trials that are really for metastatic cancer. Lastly, I just want to say, with regard to biology, that sometimes it just doesn't even matter what the mutation is. Cancers that have lots of mutations might just be different in that very sense of how many mutations you have. This is a concept called mutational load. We don't have the full picture in breast cancer yet, but it's certainly been the case in other diseases that you can predict how a cancer is going to behave by the number of mutations or what that mutational load is. This is from our study. We um, published this a couple of years ago. 
to just demonstrate that the duration of response to the next therapy the patient got was in fact impacted by the number of mutations, mutation alert, regardless of what those mutations were. That when the patient got that biopsy and then went on the therapy, those that had a low number of mutations responded to that next therapy for a lot longer than those who had a high number of mutations. So what does that tell us? That's an even different piece of information. And that tells us that the tumors that have lots of mutations are good at adapting. They're good at becoming resistant. They got to the point of having lots of mutations because they can adapt to their environment. And that, those are the tumors actually that seem to be the most responsive to immunotherapy. Because your immune system, if it's keeping any kind of lid on this at all, is gonna slow things down. And that those tumors might have very few mutations. But the ones with a lot, they're just, they're just ripping their way through, the immune system can't stop them at all. And those are the ones that we think we should be targeting with immunotherapy. Okay, so I'm gonna switch now to treatment. Hope everybody's with me. We've got 11 minutes left to go. So we're almost there, home stretch. I know this is a lot of technical stuff. When we talk about whether we are curing women with metastatic breast cancer or whether we are extending survival. Those are not the same thing, of course, right? Cure would mean you're done. We got rid of it. Go out, live your life, never think about breast cancer again. And of course, that, look, I will be the first one to stand up and say, this is it. I, I, there are many other things I could do with my life. I, I, I would be very happy to be out of a job. So we all want that. But in the meantime, if we could find treatments that allow people to live a long time, then, as I said at the beginning, that could be a win, right? That could be a win. So we have to design our trials to be able to see that. And I just wanted to make this point that it can be hard to uh, interpret the data from clinical trials as to whether or not it extends survival. And so lots of good drugs look good for the group of patients who are getting them right when they get them. They might respond to them for a long period of time, longer than if they took typical therapy. But then once they become resistant to the drug, well, their cancer makes up for lost time and they don't live longer. So we have to be thinking in these clinical trials, not only does the drug let people have control of the disease longer, but does that translate into living longer? And so this is just a diagram that I've used to try to explain this. It's a particular problem with ER positive breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, because we're testing a lot of new therapies right at the beginning. And the impact of that new therapy you see is a very small piece of the overall time that the patient is going to be living and that cancer has a lot of time to make up for lost ground. And so a drug that truly works will not only allow that period of time while the patient's on it to be extended, but will actually extend this entire timeline, right? That doesn't happen very often, but it happened in the last couple of years with the advent of CDK4-6 inhibitors. You all probably know this, but I'll just be quick. Oh, sorry, ooh, how do I go back? There, too quick, right. Um, so you see this um, blue circle on the left side, that's called, no, right side, called cyclin D. Cyclin D is a really important protein. It's coded by a gene called CCND1, and you know what that means now, right? And it then turns on the cell to divide. Now, your cells should not just be dividing willy-nilly. They should be stopping if they get damaged, repairing their DNA, and then starting to divide again. And that's what cyclin D does. Cyclin D says, I'll put the brakes on while you repair yourself, cell. And when you're done, let me know, and I'll start you dividing again. The problem is that in breast cancer, cyclin D can get out of whack. And instead of stopping the cell from dividing and letting the cell repair itself, it just gives the go signal. No matter what, no matter how bad the cell is damaged, it just gives the go signal. So there are lots of things that feed into cyclin D you can see there, and one of them is called CDK4-6, and it's another one of these regulators that turns on the go button, okay? And so what the orange line is, is where CDK4-6 inhibitors work. They interrupt that switch 
that's telling the cell to just divide willy-nilly and allowing cells to stop dividing, okay? And they don't necessarily die, but they stop dividing. And when they stop dividing, they can't go into new places, they can't interfere with how your organs are functioning, they can't cause pain, they're just sitting there. And eventually, they will die. So this is really a very new approach. It's not chemotherapy where you go in and just kill the cells and kill a lot of normal cells while you're at it. It's a very targeted stealth uh, approach, a laser-like approach to go in and say, I'm just going to interrupt this one little interaction. And when you do that, you make the cells stop dividing. And so we now have three approved drugs. Many of you in this room are probably on one of these drugs. I've been, I was very fortunate to be involved in the development of the first one, palbociclib, when it started as um, the first humans. And in fact, I treated the very first breast cancer patient who lived for 16 months after having been through 10 different treatments for metastatic breast cancer and felt really good on that. And we knew this was something special because that just didn't happen in those days. And now it's normal. See there? Now it's normal. So that's the kind of thing that that observation was unheard of when we started, and now it's normal. And I, I just you know, can't believe I've gotten to see that in my lifetime, and it makes me understand how much hope there is that we're gonna continue to do even better. And so this is just the data. I thought it would be nice to show you a few data curves from the New England Journal. Blue are the patients who got palbociclib with their fulvestrant compared to those who did not. It's good to be higher up so the left uh, axis, the vertical axis, is the proportion of patients who are living. And the horizontal axis at the bottom is time and months. And so you want to be high, because that means that lots of the greater proportion of women are living for many more months. And so when we looked at this study overall, and these were women who'd already had the tumor stop responding to an endocrine therapy, and then they went on to the next endocrine therapy and added the palbociclib, we saw that they, lit, that they responded to that drug and, in fact, lived longer, seven months longer on the whole. That improvement in survival, not just responding to the drug, but living longer with their metastatic breast cancer was even more pronounced if they had endocrine sensitive cancers, which means that at some point in the past, the tumor had been sensitive to those antiestrogens like Arimidex or Tamoxifen. The other important thing about these studies is can we use these more targeted therapies to help push off the need for chemotherapy? Because I think that's a win too. If you can be living with taking a pill every day and not losing your hair, as opposed to coming into the office every week for an infusion and wearing a wig or, or feeling that horrible feeling of not looking like yourself, that's a win. So delaying time to chemotherapy is a new kind of endpoint that we're now looking at. And these are things that the Food and Drug Administration are, to their credit, recognizing as valuable things for patients, that just being able to live longer with a chronic disease, to be able to push off chemotherapy, to not lose your hair, to be less toxic, they never used to let us use those criteria as a way to get drugs approved. They're changing. They're recognizing they should be approving drugs just because they're equally effective but less toxic. They should be approving drugs that are just as good as another drug, but maybe you get some benefit from the first drug, and then you get to take the second one so you have more options. The next drug doesn't have to be better. It doesn't have to be more effective if it has other benefits. And I think that's also a real win for patients, and that's really going to change the number of drugs that you're going to have access to. And I've been working a lot with the FDA on what are these endpoints, how can we change them, and what are the drugs that really have that capability? How do we measure these things? So unfortunately, that means when you're on a clinical trial, we're going to be asking you a lot more questions about what are your side effects and how do you feel. But we're incorporated into uh, what we call patient reported outcomes, where you can do it at home and you just are basically keeping a diary but telling us how you're feeling. And they're listening to how you're feeling because they're listening to those outcomes. So I think that's also empowering. We also need to know what to do when cancers get resistant. And this is just a, a diagram that shows, hey, if you switch the endocrine therapy, maybe you should just stay on that. So we need to think about what are the right sequences what else should we use? It's not just one drug and then another one drug. We're actually going to start building 
platforms of drugs, combinations of drugs, like in HIV, where now they have highly active retroviral therapy. It didn't work to just give one drug because HIV was smart and it got resistant. And now they take a cocktail. And they put that whole cocktail into one pill that you take once a day. OK, if they can do that in HIV, we can do that in breast cancer. Again, this is a place, yes, this is a place where if it's possible, then it can happen. We've seen it's possible. We can make it happen. OK, HER2 positive disease, there's a whole session on that this, uh, later today, so I don't want to take too much time. But there, are, there is a whole population now of women with HER2 positive breast cancer who have been taking anti-HER2 antibodies and are living very long time, a decade or more since those drugs were approved in 2005. Why? Because it happened to hit a very common driver in HER2 positive breast cancer. So antibodies for HER2 positive breast cancer, where that's the driver, can work for a very long time. And in fact, one of the things I do is work in our cooperative group. And we're talking now about a nationwide study to try to pull all of those women together who have been responding for 10 or 15 years and try to figure out, well, how can we learn from that so that we can apply that to all women with HER2 positive breast cancer? And alternatively, for a woman who's been getting her septin for 10 years every three weeks, which costs a fortune and requires an infusion, is there a point where we could actually stop it safely? That's scary, of course. Very scary for you, very scary for us. We got to come up with ways that we can test that in the least scary way possible. Because if we succeed, if we cure people, we're only going to know if we can stop the treatment and the cancer doesn't come back, right? And that's, that's a scary step to take, but I think we can do it. But it's going to take special kinds of trials to be able to do that. We could find a cure for metastatic breast cancer, but if we don't ever stop the treatment, we won't know we have it. So we have to figure out how to do that. So you know, this is just um, a lesson from a trial that actually Dr. Carey did that compared one anti-HER2 drug. If you gave one at a time versus two at a time, how did patients do? And they had to get biopsies so they could look at it. And what they looked at was that you could improve the, res the response might have been improved by adding the second drug. And people lived longer if they were sensitive to the drug. So it's not just giving a drug, but it's giving a drug and seeing if the patient is sensitive to it, seeing if the tumor is sensitive to it. And how do we figure that out? Well, we start to look at these newer kind of subtypes called molecular subtypes. And so they thought that if patients had this special kind of subtype, they, um, they really responded for much longer. They also saw that if there were immune cells in the tumor, they responded longer as well. So we learned from that trial that it's very important. And I'm going to just end with triple negative breast cancer. And I'm going a little bit over, but I won't be very long. Because this is important as well. And of course, this is, we always think, a very scary kind of breast cancer. It's not as scary, I think, as many people make out, because I think there are really two flavors along the lines of what I've just said about HER2 positive breast cancer, the responsive kind of triple negative breast cancer and the non-responsive kind of triple negative breast cancer. But we also are now learning that the immune system is super important. Dr. Carey wanted me to share with you this slide, which was a, sl a, a trial that she did targeting a specific mutation in triple negative breast cancer that unfortunately didn't work. And it didn't work because it illustrates that point I made about the drivers and the passengers. And first of all, you got to find the car. you got to look inside. you got to figure out who's the passenger, who's the driver. And that was a situation where a drug that was matched to the tumor didn't work. I, I bring this up again because I know that some of you are getting reports about the tumor genomics the profile on your cancer, and it says, oh, you should take this drug. You should take this drug. It's possible that you'll respond. It's possible that you won't respond, but it's a not a one-to-one -one correlation. And sometimes I think it comes across as that we have it nailed much better than we do and sets you up for disappointment that, oh, I thought I had this mutation, and then this drug was going to work. Now you understand why it doesn't always work. And that's OK. It just means to set your expectations that maybe it'll work. And then maybe something that looked like it wouldn't work would work as well. And so that's OK, too. And then finally, the immune system. So why is the immune system important? Well, we already have it. It's designed to attack foreign invaders. And cancer is certainly that. 
It turns on and off naturally and automatically. The cells are stable. They don't mutate. Your immune system can adapt, but it doesn't get those DNA problems like cancer cells do. The problem is the cancers look a lot like normal cells, some more than others. The immune system is incredibly complicated, and it's responding to lots of things in your body, not just the cancer cells, and it's trying to prioritize and figure out what it's going to respond to next. And if your cancer cells don't look very different from your normal cells, they get pretty low on the priority list compared to that terrible thing you just you know, breathed in from the smog in the air or that uh, you know, food poisoning you just got. Right? They've got, they got a, a big job to do. So cancer is not always their top priority. And then sometimes they get it wrong. And people in thought immune diseases have immune systems that just don't work right. They get turned on and they don't know how to turn off. So we've been trying to figure out how to do this for, gosh, going on like 30 years, right? This was the first cover of Newsweek in 1985. We're going to find a cure with interleukin-2, the first immunotherapy. Has anybody heard of interleukin-2? Not very many, right? Yeah, why is that? Because it didn't really work. But finally, we're making progress. So 30 years later, here was the 2018 cover of Science Magazine showing that we really are making progress. So it's taken a very long time because it is very complicated. There are several different ways to go. I'm not going to go into this in detail. But there are different targets within the immune system. And vaccines are not the only way to go. You can actually target different kinds of immune cells. You can target proteins on immune cells. And I'm going to show you an example of one of those and how it works. So why does immunotherapy work in some cancers better than others? This is another big question. Breast cancer has kind of always been ahead of the curve. And yet all of a sudden, with immunotherapy, we're behind the curve. Other cancers are gotten much further with immunotherapy than we have in breast cancer. If you think about the cancers that have responded best to immunotherapy, they are the cancers where the tissues are exposed to the outside world. Oral, lung, skin, OK? Um, you're breathing in air. You're exposed with your skin. Your mouth and your, and your esophagus are exposed to the food you eat. So your immune system is already there, poised to attack invaders. So the way the immune system works in those areas of your body where it's already ready to attack is very different than the breast. Not many things happen in the breast. So the immune system kind of ignores the breast. It's not very activated in the breast. It's not putting on its radar to look for what's happening in the breast. And breast cancer cells are so smart that they figured out how to take advantage of that and basically put themselves in an invisibility cloak. So the immune system is not even going to notice because it's got many more other important things. So we have to figure out how to uncover the breast cancers in the breast so the immune system will see them and come to the rescue. So I'm just going to try to explain what this mechanism is of checkpoint inhibitors that you've heard about. This is atezolizumab, the drug that just got approved for triple negative breast cancer. This is pembrolizumab, a drug that's been approved for many other kinds of breast cancer. They all work this way. You've got your T cell. That's the immune cell. You've got your tumor cell. The T cell and the tumor cell actually should be recognizing each other. They're designed to recognize foreign cells. So if the T cell is doing its job, it recognizes the tumor cell, it attacks it, tumor cell dies. Okay? However, T cells also have an off switch. Like I told you, your immune system has to go on and off. It's, if it's on all the time, then you have an autoimmune disease and you can't survive. So PD-1 is the off switch. So what would you do if you were a tumor cell and you were going to get attacked by a T cell? Well, you'd want to turn the off switch, right? And so PD-1 and PD-L1 now interact and they turn off the, the, the ability of the T cell to attack the tumor cell, OK? So how could we take advantage of that? Well, we can, draw, we can block PD-1. So that's a PD-1 inhibitor on the T cell. Or we can block PD-L1, which is the other piece of it that's on the tumor. We also can look to see whether the tumor has PD-L1 or how much PD-1 is in your immune system and the cells that are around your tumor. So when you hear about this testing for PD-1, testing for PD-L1, this is what they're talking about. Do you see that down? Brown and yellow interaction. 
that's the tumor turning off the immune system switch. So if we could block that, essentially what we could do is block that interaction with a PD-1 inhibitor or a PD-L1 inhibitor, so then the tumor can't turn off the immune system and the immune system can kill the tumor cell again. That is it. That is the whole story. It's not that complicated, but I think it can be kind of hard to understand, so I'm hoping that makes sense. So the first drug that was really successful at doing this in breast cancer was an anti-PD-L1 antibody, so it's on the cancer, called atezolizumab, okay? It was given, sorry, in combination with chemotherapy, the drug Abraxane, and compared to women who were just getting Abraxane alone and a sugar pill. And this is the result. Remember I said it's better to be higher up. So blue were the people who took the atezolizumab, red were the people who were given the placebo, and you see there was a difference 25 months versus 15 months, and about a third, more than half of the women were still alive two years later, compared to only about a third of the women who didn't get the atezolizumab were alive two years later. So this was a big win. This led the FDA to approve this combination now for triple negative breast cancer, but with the caveat that you had to be able to see the PD-1 uh, present. Not, not all tumors and not all um, immune cells that are attacking tumors utilize this mechanism. You need to have things tested to see if it's going to work because it really only worked there. So what do we do when you don't have this mechanism? Well, we call those tumors that are turned on to the immune system hot tumors. The immune system can recognize them. We've got these tumors that are cold tumors. We have to be able to convert cold tumors to hot tumors. And that's really the new frontier through vaccines, through other kinds of things that we turn on to basically dissolve the invisibility cloak and make those tumors hot. And that's a lot of work in progress, but that's the next generation of trials that's going to really make immunotherapy work in breast cancer, is converting these cold tumors to hot. So what I've shown you is that we really have a lot of tools at our disposal. We have a lot of drugs. What we have to understand is how to deploy them appropriately to the right tumors at the right time in the right patient in the right order. And you know, the hard part is getting the tools. The, should be easier to figure out how to use them the correct way. And I think that's where we need more research. We, I want to take a moment to really thank you because none of this would happen without patients who are willing to partner with us to do the clinical trials we do that make these kinds of advances happen. And that's hard. I, I recognize, I talked to many, many women about participating in clinical trials. It's a leap of faith. It's a leap of faith that you take with us to say, I'm willing to do something that's unproven because it might work, and I trust that you're going to keep me safe. I don't take that lightly. I know my colleagues don't either. We really appreciate our patient advocates who work closely with us on your behalf to make sure the research we're doing is safe and that we're being careful and that we are making sure that we don't put anyone in harm's way if we can avoid it. And by doing that together, I think that's really how we're going to make this problem go away, is by partnering together, listening to each other, working together to come up with the strategies that are going to help us use these tools in the best possible ways. And with that, I'm sorry I've gone over, but I would say thank you for your attention. And I was really happy to be here today. Thank you, Angie. We're going we're gonna to have you sit down. Um, so for those of you that are on the live, we have, I didn't mention this, but we have an audience watching via live stream. So hundreds or a thousand more people <laughs> have been participating, which is great. And that's something at Living Beyond Breast Cancer we've really been trying to do because we know sometimes you just can't get to where the conferences are, which also means that this entire talk is, will be available via video. So you guys can watch it multiple times and take lots of notes because I feel like I just went through medical school and I failed. <laughs> So, oh, no, I hope it wasn't too complicated. Um, so as questions come in, uh, Janine and Kathy are going to be feeding them. But those of you in the ballroom, if you're not hooked up to your Wi-Fi and you want to be, it's LBBC, all capital, and it's 2019, and you all have the text number. So, And remember, in the workshops, we have workshops on every 
on HER2 positive and ER positive, triple negative, and metastatic. So you'll have lots more time to ask questions. Um, but let's just start because some people were asking, how do they find trials? What is the best way to find them? And we certainly know that um, some of our partners here have places, the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance, but sort of as a clinician, what do you, how do you direct your patients? Well, I think there are, are several ways to go, and uh, unfortunately, there isn't just one-stop shopping for this. Uh, I, I wish there were, and there are, um, there are lots of conversations going on on how we can do this. In fact, this was, I think, one of the most important things coming out of the Biden initiative was to try to figure out how to help people get to clinical trials. But until then, you're going to have to use several different mechanisms. Your doctor is always the first stop, OK? Your doctor should know what clinical trials are out there um, because they're paying attention to the research, and they should be able to help direct you. What does your doctor use? Well, your doctor probably uses something called clinicaltrials.gov, which is the database that's kept by the National Cancer Institute that lists every single clinical trial. But you can go on clinicaltrials.gov as well and look for clinical trials. You type in the keywords breast cancer, metastatic, triple negative, or whatever kind you have, and up will come a lot of entries. So I always, I think it's helpful if you're computer savvy and comfortable with that to go in and do the search. It's going to print out a lot of trials. You're not going to know which ones are best, but it's actually going to help your doctor if you come into the office for your visit holding that piece of paper that has all those trials listed, because then you can go through it with them together and figure out whether there's one that matches for you. Yeah, and if you find that overwhelming, there is metastatictrialsearch.org, which is on the Living Beyond Breast Cancer site. The Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance have, has lots of resources yeah. as well. So let's just get to a couple of questions. What if you haven't had genomic testing? When, when do you do that? So I would say that right now, there is no time where it is absolutely essential to do genomic testing because there isn't a treatment that we use that's reliant on it. Of course, we have PARP inhibitors that are approved, but that's for patients who have BRCA1 or 2 mutations. That's testing that's done through the blood. Now we have checkpoint inhibitors. That's through PD-1 testing. That's done on the tumor, but not through genomic testing. That's testing a protein. So the tr treatments that we have right now don't rely on genomic testing. However, it might be possible to go onto a clinical trial if you have genomic testing and you happen to have a mutation that a trial is testing. So I think the times to think about doing it are, first of all, when you're initially diagnosed with metastatic disease to confirm that it's metastatic. And also about 20% of the time, the receptors change between the primary tumor and the metastatic tumor. And you want to make sure that you know what your receptor is on your metastatic tumor. The second time to think about getting tested is when your tumor stops responding and becomes resistant to a treatment, because that tells your doctor there's a change, and that would be the time to do a biopsy to be able to understand what was potentially driving that change. Because think about it, if we were testing serially, we'd see which new things were getting turned on. And then finally, if there's a clinical trial that might be available to you, then you might need to have a biopsy for that. And for that, you need actual tissue biopsy, or, or is it okay to have a liquid biopsy? So most clinical trials right now require a tumor biopsy if they're doing this, um, because liquid biopsy is still an early technology. We will be starting a clinical trial um, using liquid biopsy um, in the next year, but it's not in the metastatic setting. It's in women who have already been treated for triple negative breast cancer looking for these these um, fragments of DNA in the blood. We're not quite there yet, but there are new trials being developed that will ultimately allow you to use blood. So you just need to ask your doctor. I think increasingly, you know, the kind of data I showed you where there's high fidelity between the tumor and the blood means we're going to be able to start using the blood, and that's going to be an enormous benefit. Yeah, that would be helpful. Janine, are you ready with a question? Sure. Sure. For people who have not had surgery or had a biopsy that wasn't large enough to do genomic testing, what should they do to move forward? So um, I think, again, the most important thing is understanding your receptors. Is this tumor estrogen or progesterone receptor positive? Because that's going to take you down a pathway for hormone therapies. Is this tumor HER2 positive? That's going to take you down a pathway for HER2-directed therapies. Or is it triple negative? That's the most important thing to know. 
Short of that, I would say there are companies that do testing with liquid biopsies, like Gardent has a commercial assay available. So if you just want to know for your own benefit, you can do that. Sometimes your insurance will pay for it, sometimes it won't. But more often than not, the best treatment for you isn't hinging on having genomic testing. So it's okay. It's okay to not have genomic testing. Maybe you'll have it in the future. You can always do it later. It's okay not to have it right now. So there, we know there, as you talked about, there are now three approved CD4K6 inhibitors. So what do we know about the sequencing? If you fail on one, can you go to another? like hormonal therapy, or sort of how is that going to play out? So um, this is a really cool story that is playing out. Um, it's still incomplete, but there's sort of three different possibilities. One is that you get a mutation that just makes this a non-issue, and that's very rare. So a mutation in something called RB means you'll never respond to a CDK4-6 inhibitor again, but that happens a very small fraction of the mm -hmm. time. What's more common is that your cancer adapts by using other pathways, like a detour, okay? Taking a detour to get to the, to the destination. And so if we can figure out what the detours are, we can add drugs. So you'd stay on the CDK4-6 inhibitor and add a drug that blocks the detour. So that's another strategy. These are being tested in clinical trials. Third strategy, it turns out that there are two pathways to turn on the cell cycle, cyclin D and cyclin E, which I didn't show you in my diagram. We're blocking cyclin D with these drugs. Cancers get smart and they start using cyclin E as their alternative. Turns out that if you then stop the CDK inhibitor, cancers can switch back. So it might be that if your CDK inhibitor stops working after a while and then you stop it, go on to some other treatment, you'll be able to come back and use it again in the mm. future. Oh my gosh. So we're learning how to test for that. Um, and so these are all different strategies. And then there is the fourth, which is even more exciting, which is that there seems to be some very important connection between this pathway and the immune system, and we're now starting to do some trials that combine it with immunotherapy. But so for a patient, that's a scary time. So um, it is a scary time, and um, there are many trials around. We have several going on. But in the absence of a trial, what I will tell you is it's okay to move to the next therapy that is typically given the standard of care, which if you're on aromatase inhibitor will be to move to fulvestrant. If you're on fulvestrant, that would be to move to um, aromacin plus affinator. If you've been through all the antiestrogens, it's to move to chemotherapy. So there's tons of options that don't require the CDK4-6 inhibitor. And that's what you should do if you don't go on a trial. So I'm just letting you know that's the strategy we're looking at, but patients, I have many patients who stopped responding to CDK4-6 inhibitor, have gone on to fulvestrant or aromacin, and are doing great. Right. Right. So that, that's scary, but it, it, it's totally possible. And then I've gone, given them that break, and then added the CDK inhibitor back on if it stopped, if the aromacin or the fulvestrant stopped working, and it starts responding again. That's so crazy. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's a lot, this is the art, right? And this is, I think, what's also especially hard with metastatic breast cancer is a lot of the treatment is really an art. It has to be adapted to you and your cancer. And you can't compare your treatment sequence really to anybody else's because there are so many factors that enter into how we decide what the next treatment is, and that can be scary as well. But it's important that your doctor is really thinking about that in a very unique, tailored fashion for you. Yeah. Janine? We have a couple of questions from people who um, might have been eligible for a targeted therapy but were started on a chemotherapy and are asking whether it's possible to sort of do the reverse of what you showed in your slide, that you start with, with chemo and then move into something with CDK inhibitors or, or Absolutely. Um, we do it all the time. We particularly do it when we discover stage four cancer. We don't know how fast it's growing and it might be in some vital organ like your liver. And we want to do something to just get it under control. That's sort of like, we call that induction, induce a response. So you might do chemo for just a short period of time, see the cancer shrink and then, okay, take a sigh of relief. I've got some time. Now I can switch over to targeted therapy, which might take a little longer to work. 
Um, so we, heard, we, we got a press release, I don't know, a few weeks ago that Herceptin is now available subcutaneously. Mm. So is that something that will become an option um, for patients who are, especially, particularly those that are on Herceptin for long periods of time? Yeah, we are very excited about alternative ways to give these antibodies. You know, it's, it, this, is a, this is a classic case of we study something one way we see that it works, and then we're sort of locked into always having to do it that way, even if it stops making sense. Mm -hmm. And so as new, as new ways of giving the drugs come along, I mean, this is going to revolutionize things for women who are outside the United States and yeah. don't have access to infusional Herceptin. Think about that. I mean, it's an amazing thing. Um, so we're very open, really, I think more than ever before, to finding new ways to do this. It turns out that the Herceptin antibody stays in your system for a really long time. And that every three weeks was sort of, I hate to say this, but not a little bit arbitrary in terms of how it was decided to be given. Um, it might, it, it, it just shows to show you that if you give it a different way and just get it in there, that it's gonna work and there isn't just one way to do it. Right, okay, go ahead, Janine. A couple of, as a follow up to that, a couple of folks are asking about why HER2 positive metastatic disease is not responsive to immunotherapy and what we understand about that. So I would say that it's not, that it's not responsive. Um, in fact, Herceptin and other monoclonal antibodies are actually a form of immunotherapy. They're antibodies, right? They're mimicking what your immune system could do if it could turn off the HER2 receptor. Uh, and they're an antibody, they're not chemotherapy. So in fact, they are immunotherapy, but they're not immunotherapy the way we're now thinking about immunotherapy. We know that HER2 cancers, many, if not most of them, have a lot of immune cells around them. The problem is they're not turned on. Uh, it draws the immune system in, but it doesn't always lead to the immune system being able to recognize the tumor. And so it's actually very encouraging. I think we're going to find a way. We don't actually have to go to the step to bring the cells in. They're already there. We just got to figure out how to turn them on. So we'll get there. We'll get okay. there. Go ahead. Another question that uh, we've gotten from a few people is if the cancer is um, remaining controlled on a treatment, even for a long period of time, is it better to just continue on that treatment because if it isn't broke, don't try and fix it, or should you try and do a clinical trial or make a change? Yeah, that's a really, really hard question, and it's a really hard decision. We don't have good data to guide us. We haven't done a lot of trials with breaks. Um, in therapy to be, see what happens. Um, and the, the conventional wisdom has always been to not stop a treatment that's working. I think it has to be decided on a very individual basis, but I would say in general, my advice is to not stop something that's working, um, that wait to take that next step, because we really want to try to get every ounce of benefit out of every treatment we have. And by stringing those long responses together, we create a life. So we, we want to get every, every day we can out of a treatment and not go to the next thing till we have to. So when someone does fail on that treatment, though, how long, as they're looking for a trial, I mean, how long do you feel like they can be off treatment? We certainly hear from a lot of women who are in that waiting phase and feeling very panicked. Yeah, so, and just to be clear, the patient didn't fail, right? right? <laughs> Not fail, sorry, sorry. I know. But the treatment failed the patient. Right, if right, the treatment is failing the patient, uh, you're gonna need some time to figure out what to do next, and that's okay. It takes a while, actually, for things to get out of control, and although it feels like the clock is ticking, um, it, it, it is, You've got more time than you think. So take a breath, take a beat. You've got a few weeks. You, for clinical trials, we typically say you have to be off the last therapy for 28 days. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it takes 28 days for the last treatment to get out of your system for us to see if a new treatment's gonna work, right? So think about that. That's four weeks just for the last treatment to get out of your system. So it's still there doing something. So it just put it, puts it in perspective that you have some time. Okay, that's helpful. Go ahead, Janine. So our next question, I, I want to give you an opportunity to respond to um, some questions that folks are asking about 
the use of the term chronic for metastatic yeah. breast cancer. And um, one person writes, you're incredibly optimistic and hopeful and we need to hear that. Um, but very few of us live very long periods of time. Exceptional responders are still rare. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about describing metastatic breast cancer as chronic and, and how you think about it? And um, another person sort of asks it as, is it possible to get to a state of remission? Yeah, yeah. An These are great state. questions. I mean, they're, look, we're, uh, like I said, 20 years ago when I started, these were not conversations we were even having. So we, the fact that we're able to have these conversations just goes to show you, even though five years ago, we weren't having these conversations, okay? Five years ago. So the fact that we can have these conversations means we're making great progress. Um, on the other hand, um, when I think about, there, there are these little, groups of patients who have very exceptional situations where they may go on Herceptin. I have a group of these patients in, in, my, in my practice. I've been on Herceptin now for 10 years and their cancer isn't showing up on a scan or their PET scan has gone dark. Um, the problem that we know is that those cells can still be there. And the, if you turn off the brake, they can start up again. And so, it's hard to know if someone's truly um, in a state where the cancer isn't going to start growing again. So what's remission? Remission is a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, in leukemia, remission is you don't see any leukemia cells in the bloodstream. I think that what I think about for remission in metastatic breast cancer is that that breast cancer is sitting there. It's living in your body, but maybe it's not doing anything. It's just a resident. It's just, you know, that really annoying, you know, <laughs> relative that won't leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they're not causing any, but it's not causing any problems. It's not getting in the way. It's not causing you to have dysfunction of your lungs or your liver. It's not traveling through your body and causing new problems. So it's almost like a symbiotic kind of relationship that you don't really want to have. But if you can have it, you can live. And if we can just keep it in check and we can do it with drugs that aren't toxic, to me, that's kind of like remission. It's not good enough, and I'm not saying that we should consider ourselves done. But I think it's a way to move forward while we are getting to that point. Does that help? Yeah. I think we have one time for one more question. OK. So. <laughs> Yes, we'll take one last question, and I, I do want to share with everyone that in the first session of workshops, um, we'll, have, we'll be focusing on each of the subtypes. So a lot of the questions that came through we'll be able to address in the yeah, workshops. Yeah. We're, we're sorry that we can't go on. Um, so for our closing question, um, a number of people have asked, what is it that causes the cells to wake up? Mm. Great question. Um, we're only, uh, you know, tip of the iceberg on this. Um, so there's two different things that we've started to get a handle on. Okay. The first is, remember I told you it was like the computer powering down, right? So the electrical system goes off. So one trigger is that the electrical system powers up again. That happens through um, a couple of different pathways, one called mTOR, one called CMET. This is sort of like the nerve system of the tumor. So it turns back on again. The second thing is a really interesting process called autophagy. Autophagy is a cell's ability to stop dividing and stay alive. So remember I told you it's rare for cancer cells to stay alive if they stop dividing. But they figured out how to use this process. And I liken it to a bear hibernating in a cave for the winter. They basically hibernate. They don't need any outside energy source, and they use their own internal organelles for energy. So they're just sort of sitting there hibernating. So that's the best way to think about it, using this process called autophagy to stay alive even though they aren't dividing. Now, this is really interesting because autophagy, it turns out, is something you can target. You can use drugs to make a cell not be able to use autophagy. And the drug, it turns out, that's best at doing that is called hydroxychloroquine. Hydroxychloroquine is a drug that we have used for the last 30 years for malaria, 
We also use it for autoimmune diseases. Um, and now we're testing it in women who have dormant tumor cells. Because it, in the mice that had dormant tumor cells, it made the cells die. So it would be fantastic to have a drug like hydroxychloroquine, which is safe, cheap, oral, that we could use for this kind of a problem. But it just goes to show you that you need a very different approach for these kinds of things. The drugs we've used before just aren't gonna work. We have to really think outside the box. Well, thank you so much. Wow. Thank you all very much. I think you did an amazing job explaining how complicated it is, <laughs> but also how much work is being done and how much thought and creativity. So it's, it, you know, it is, it is optimistic. So I want to thank everyone for their attention. We're going to have a break, um, and then please visit the exhibitors and then choose the workshop that you want to attend. Thank you. I think you're going to be surrounded.